Good evening and welcome to Open Your Eyes to the Universe. I'm Carolyn Ward and I'm stepping in this evening for Gabriel Martin and very happy to be back. And tonight, um, I got to choose who I'd like to sit down and have a chat with. And the first thing that came to my mind was a book that I was given by a friend many years ago, and it was called If Nuns Ruled the World. And I thought, yeah, I wonder what that would be like. Let's dive in, not about ruling the world, but the idea of um, nuns has changed so much over the last number of years, uh, decades really, from when I was growing up and had hankerings to be Audrey Hepburn in the nun story, except for the tragic end. Um, and so I thought it would be really interesting to sit down with some women who are living dedicated spiritual lives of service and what does it look like today? And so we've got three, I think, amazing women on tonight's uh, program. And because of time zones and because of the way the world is today, I had to sit down a little earlier in the week with a couple of them. Marianne from Costa Rica is currently sleeping and um, Pia, who's in Taiwan, could have sat with us, but not at this time. So as much as it would have been lovely to be live, um, I have many feelings of gratitude for Zoom and the the ability to travel all over the world and bring people from everywhere. So what we're going to do is we're first going to meet Pia. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Pia. She'll tell you a bit more about herself. But um, she doesn't call herself a nun. And even though she has been um, ordained uh, as a novice at different times, she's not currently kind of living a monastic life, though that is what she liked to be called. She was born in Messina, Italy. Her name is um, Pia Giamassi uh, in 1964, and she grew up in the United States. After graduating from the University of Massachusetts um, with a degree in legal studies, she went to Asia to seek the wisdom of the East. After having formally entered into Buddhist training in Nepal and India, she was assigned to teach at a small Buddhist center in Hong Kong by the Dalai Lama. It was there that she met Master Nan Huai Chin in early 1989, and he became her, really her first and most important teacher. He encouraged her to go and learn and study Chinese medicine, which she did do and graduated. Many things in between, and she worked with him many times and became a fluent translator in Chinese. And in fact, in today's session, we're going to begin our session together. Um, and she's going to chant the Buddhist Heart Sutra as a way of taking us into her practice. So please enjoy Pia. She works these days as a healer. Um, she works with music. She teaches Buddhist Dharma teachings. Her life is her Dharma path. Um, you're going to love her. She's fabulous. So enjoy. Okay. So. Or Bolo Mito Shin Jing Guan Zi Zai Pusa Shin Sam Bor Bolo Mito Shi Zao Jian Wu Yun Jie Kong Du Yi Chie Ku Se Li Zi Se Bu Yi Kong Kong Bu Yi Se Se Ji Shi Kong Kong Ji Shi Shi Shou Xiang Xin Shi Yi Fu Lu Shi Se Li Zi Shi Zhu Fa Kong Xiang 不生不灭不垢不净不增不减是故空中无事无休善心是无言的毕舍是你有是三生未出发，无言界乃至无意识界无名亦无,无明尽乃至无老死亦无老死尽无不见灭道无知亦无得亦无所得故。
Puti sato i boro boro mi to gu xinu gua yu gua yu gu yu kong bu yin li dian da meng xiang jiu jing ni pan san shi zhu fo i boro boro mi to gu. De anu to ro san miak san pu ti gu zhi boro boro mi to shi da shen zhou shi da ming zhou shi wu xiang zhou shi wu deng deng zhou. Neng chu yi che ku zhen shi bu shi gu shu bo lu bo lu mi to zhou ji shu zhu yu ga te ga te pa ra ga te Pa ra sum ga te bu di shu a ga te ga te pa ra ga te pa ra sum ga te bu di shu a ga te ga te pa ra ga te Pa ra sum ga te bu di shu ha So um, I just recited uh, the Heart Sutra in Chinese, and it's a practice I do every morning, uh, on a, or sometime during the day at least, but normally in the morning. And it's uh, the sutra, it's a very central sutra that talks about the connection between um, emptiness or potential and manifestation. And so how everything, how everything is, is both, um, comes from the, the emptiness, the potential of all, the potential of everything to grow from the original source. So it's, uh, it's the fact that we are never disconnected from source. Everything, everything comes from and is one with source. Um, so that's, a that's. I guess the, it's the heart of the Buddhist teachings. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Pia, so much. It's a very powerful thing to remember every day, right? That yes. in any moment, anything can be born and is trying to be born. Something's trying to be born at every moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Um, so very warm welcome and thank you so much for agreeing to be with us in what I feel is a really special um session of universe because this week um i'm sitting in for gabrielle which i've already mentioned but we're looking at how women in a contemporary time are exploring a life of dedicated service and spirituality um which some are formally called nuns or monks or monastics and others maybe don't name it as that but live that lifestyle and so we're just exploring and so Pia thank you very much maybe you can tell us first of all um your name is Pia Giamassi is that how Giamassi. I pronounce it yeah, yeah. so it's not Tibetan even though you just you just did something in Chinese and you grew up in the States though is that right um, I was born in Italy and I grew up in the States and after university I left for Asia to um, to follow a spiritual path yeah okay so that's going to lead us into our question um, so <laughs> we ha we've had a little bit of a conversation before so I know a bit about you but for people who are watching now I find your journey very inspiring. You've been monastic and lay person in more than one tradition. And now you continue as a dedicated teacher within the Buddhist way of things. So can you take us back to the beginning of your path and share a moment or realization that ignited your deep connection to Buddhism and set you on this profound journey of spiritual service and teaching? Oh. It was a very early moment, actually. Um, it was probably in uh, around in primary school, second grade, when uh, the series Kung Fu came on with David Carradine. And when Grasshopper would uh, go to his teacher and his teacher would not only test him and, and, and teach him um, martial arts, but also he would open his wisdom, open his heart, open his mind. And at that point I decided I want to find a teacher to open my, open my wisdom. And so I decided to, I started saving money to go to, to come to, to Asia to find a, a, a teacher of great wisdom. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. And did you find your teacher of great wisdom? 
I found many teachers of great wisdom, but <laughs> a very deep connection with one particular teacher, actually. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, even though when I first, uh, I first, my, one of my first, my, uh, my, uh, my first Buddhist teacher was of the Dzogchen uh, tradition in, uh, it's a Tibetan tradition. And it's very Zen-like. And that was Namkai Norbu Rinpoche. He was, uh, I met him, um, I went to his teachings in Nepal. And that was the start of the path. Um, but my deepest connection was with a Chinese and longest connection was with a, a Chinese master named Nan Huai Jin, Master Nan Huai Jin. Um, he was a lay teacher, but he was also, um, he was the holder of several lineages and was verified as an enlightened master by um, the Hutuko of Mongolia. He's like Tibetan master of Mongolia by a uh, Chan master or the, the Chinese word for Zen, Chan master in um, uh, Chinese Chan master. And also I think in when he was in Tibet, he was also verified as enlightened by other um, mm. teachers. So great master and not very well known in the West. I, I'm sitting here and I go, oh, I want to delve into that because I find it so interesting when you say he was the holder of a number of lineages i go wow which ones how do we know what did they mean and you know i want to go there but i'm coming back to you in your, <laughs> and maybe we'll get together for another conversation but so your journey has taken you beyond the traditional monastic setting though um and your dedication to teaching and sharing buddhism and buddhist wisdom remains unwavering it's it's your grasshopper lineage um how do you find harmony between your personal dharma path and the role of a teacher and how has this unique balance enriched your understanding of spiritual service mm, i for me my life is my practice i don't separate between practice and other things. Teaching is practice. Um, eating is practice. Being with friends is practice. Um, because cultivation, spiritual cultivation is, um, is in, your, in your every action. So what are you bringing to the table? What are you bringing with you? How are you, how, you know, like, what is your motivation when you're speaking to people? Um, or, you know, like when you're doing things, it, it, looking back on yourself and how can I do things better? So for me, I don't see a separation, but um, it's, it's good to step out of the role of teacher every now and then and go back to being a student or just practicing or just stepping out of that role because that role can, it, it can, you know, things kind of take their own course. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you do, um, yeah, you don't realize that you're getting stuck. So it is important to step back. So I, you know, my life has been, um, you know, in front of, in front of the people and then stepping out and moving into something else where I can learn and I can move forward and I have more to give, uh, or, you know, yeah. So as a teacher, um, what I, my, as I evolve, as I, as I um, grow and understand and, and integrate things, and then I'll, when I'm not, if I'm not ready to bring that into teaching, then I step back from teaching until I can really bring it in. And mm. yeah, so it's been a very nice flow, actually. Beautiful. I remember many years ago, I, and I'd been traveling, teaching a lot. And I, I, at one point I thought, I'm so bored with my blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, really? I think, you know, because where I was going, it was new for everyone that was there. And they were like, oh, wow, this is fabulous. I was so bored. And I thought, I have to stop traveling. I have. And a friend of mine had said to me, you know, you know about the um, Trappist monks, they have four vows, you know, uh, poverty, chastity and obedience. 
and then their fourth is stability they once they enter they stay in one place they never leave um generally and she said don't you feel like you know maybe that would be good for you <laughs> and that stayed with me for years and then when i got bored with my own teaching nothing new was coming i thought no i have to I have to stop and you know, be where i am and do the work where i am so i love what you're saying about if you're not also if it's not ready it's not baked if you if you're still exploring it uh it has to have been embodied somehow or integrated before you can lead someone else to it is that right yeah, yeah. Uh, yes i totally agree yeah because otherwise it, it's coming from your head and people know when it comes from your head and when it comes from your heart your experience your life your your entire being they know yeah yeah yeah, that's, yeah. um so i have another question and many questions really um but i, I is yours a is yours a dedicated singular singular path have you chosen to not be in relationship with someone in a in a partnership intimate relationship have you chosen a singular life path i didn't ask um you today. i have been in relationships uh, during parts of the path and for the most part um it, it it only it only works if the other person is also a spiritual practitioner yeah right yeah okay so my third question for you which is really more than three but um so the one i have written with the deep roots of your practice and teachings there's no doubt that you have encountered profound transformation and can you share a specific instance where your journey took an unexpected turn and mm. it led to a significant shift in your perspective or approach to your own dharma path and the guidance then you provide to others like you know one of those <laughs> one of those ones you go oh no and then you go oh great that was that was exactly what i needed <laughs> yeah um I'll, I'll share two um one was more it was more it a bit more of an internal that my entire perspective on a lot of things shifted. Um, it was 1989 and I was um, with another nun. Uh, she, we were doing, a, we were learning Chinese medicine in mainland China. And in mainland China, there are four very important mountains. They're, they're called, they're Bodhi Mandalas. And we went to um, Utai San, uh, which is uh, Utai Mountain, which is the, the Bodhi Mandala of Manjushri, the Buddha of Wisdom. And it's called Utai because there's five, oh, it's five. So there's five different peaks with temples uh, on them and they're, they're you know, or, or holy places. So at that point, the transportation was not very good and we had to walk to most of them. Um, it was still very rustic at that point. And as I was, we were walking to the, the, the central, um, the central peak, um, uh, Qing Zhen Shi went ahead. She, she was kind of like feeling, she was feeling like she didn't want to, she wanted to just truck on her own. So she went up to the, went up there and I was a little bit lost, like, cause it's, it's just all mountains. And sometimes you can see the peak and sometimes you can't. And I was a little bit lost. And then at some point, um i was um something came over me and i just had this feeling of this recognition that or, or or this feeling that like i was the only one on this entire planet on this entire earth in this whole world who was not enlightened and everything and everybody the entire world was there in was an enlightened state or was an enlightened manifestation to bring me to an awakening. It was so deep and so profound that like I was just stopped in my tracks and I was just deep in that, in that, I don't know, recognize, recognition, whatever. Um, and it was very, very profound. And that was a big shift in 
seeing the divinity in everything, seeing the sacredness in, in everything at a, at a, like a very deep level. Yeah. And after that experience, um, yeah, I met a few very interesting characters in the mountain. <laughs> uh-huh yeah yeah i'm just trying to stay with what you just shared because it it's like all those amazing experiences like they're so extraordinary and profound and then you put them in words and the words can never capture doesn't matter how brilliant you are but there was something in in what you were sharing that i could i could feel into it you know mm. that, that that really there was this the whole it, 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 the whole thing changed everything became alive in a way that you'd never seen before in a way yes it it yeah it nothing changed and everything changed <laughs> that's very zen of you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Imagine if if we could live like that, right? Ready, ready to to have revealed to us in any moment. Like if we were that attentive, as in aware, to be able to catch. I I was walking up here before, and the rabbits were running around, and they play. It's so beautiful. They chase each other around the bush, and it always makes me think of the animated films that that they make. And so I imagine they're, you know, running and playing and laughing. And but it really is this sense that, you know, the world is not human centric. It's it's a coexistence of wonder. Yeah. Yes. Uh and at some level, everything is a manifestation of the of the divine, of the profound. It's it's all profound. Mm. Um, side of that, we we fall into our own world of of the profane world or the non sacred world. Mm. Mm. And Pia, as you say, the divine and the sacred within your teachings and your Wait, is is um, Buddha nature? Is that the sort of source point when you say everything connected to source? So, in maybe in Christianity, they might say God, or um, in Hinduism, it might be Paramatma. Or is that what for you is like your directed connection? Yes, yes, and it, it's neither it's neither outside of us and it's not just inside of us it, it's it's the all yeah. and and in in many buddhist texts like in some very important sutras um they even say you it may be called god it may be called you know it might be called the highest or the holiest it may be called this or that it may be called so they went through all that it may be called buddha nature it may be called buddha mm. um it but it's all pointed to something beyond words. Yeah. Yeah. And don't get hooked yeah. in, in the labels. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I want to keep talking and asking you questions. And I we need to wrap because I'm going to have now conversations with um, the others. So I'm going to ask you the four questions I'm going to ask each of the guests tonight. So and maybe you already answered the first one. Do you have a favorite daily ritual? Uh, yes, in the morning, incense offering. Uh, oh. Incense offering, heart sutra, meditation, and doing other mantras. So, but at least if I don't have time to do the others, at least just an incense offering. Yeah, that's I, for 40 something years, I haven't, I've very dedicated to doing oh. at least and some other time during the day the other practices what, what does that mean an incense offering when you make an uh, if you have a picture of buddha or even just in your mind and you're offering you, you have incense and you offer it it's it's just um it's a practice of generosity it's a practice of respecting something the something greater than the you that is greater than you 
the divine that is that you are part of but is all and it's greater than than what you are at this point that's really beautiful and anyone could do that really in yeah. their own space wherever just put Absolutely. that on. yeah beautiful um do you have a book that you would say significantly influenced your spiritual journey i mean probably many yeah. Yeah, but the first one, the very first one that influenced me very deeply was um, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. That was the only book with a, with anything Buddhist in the ho entire library uh, as a child that I could get my hands on to read. So that was very Great, thank you. Okay, I think you've answered this, but your source of strength. So when you're facing challenges or or anything really what what source of strength or mantra or practice do you turn to mm. well, sometimes mantra if it's immediate if it's something more long term then i would look in the sutras um the the teachings of the buddha directly yes to 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 look for answers for inspiration if my teacher is not available or around okay good and if you could share one piece of advice with people who are watching this and aspiring to a life of, you know, spiritual service and dedication and maybe exactly where they are, not taking up uh, any robes, but what would it be? What would be that piece of advice? Mm. Connect to your heart and connect your heart to the sacred, to the divine, whatever you call it, whether you call it Buddha, Bodhisattva or God or whatever. Uh, universal love, whatever you call it, make a direct connection because you will have teachers and they may or may not have their own connection. Um, but you you must have your own direct connection. That's where that's where your inspiration, that's where your strength, that's where your internal guidance system will come from. To know whether this is right for you, the teacher is right for you, the practice is right for you. Yeah. First connect to your heart, to yourself, then connect that to something higher which is also you yeah fabulous Pia, thank you very much um i look forward to one day meeting you in person and having oh. more conversation thank you so very much my great pleasure thank you so i really enjoyed watching that um, again, and listening to the very universal wisdom that sits there in the way that Pia does her sacred spiritual journey. So now I am going to introduce you to someone who was my first intentional guest. And this woman is Margaret Hinchy. She's a religious sister of mercy. And she's based in the Parramatta Sisters of Mercy. Now, I knew Margaret as Sister Monica when I started in primary school. She was my school principal. And I've met Margaret over the years and I've been amazed at her courage and her pioneering nature to be able to really challenge the sort of mindsets and, and belief systems that are archaic um, and really not relevant today. She's someone who um, is strong in social justice and has led many things in this country around that area. And she studied over in Chicago, her Masters of Theology, and um, came back and started something called Life Quest, which was about... I think we'll find out more, but about taking spirituality um, and exploring it rather than the traditional, more dogmatic institutional way. And her love of the mission of Jesus and social justice, cosmology, ecology, and how all of this connects with the kind of more contemporary interpretations of scripture and theology. Um, she's now in her 80s, I think, and she has just been re-elected, I think, for the uh, first time in a while, back to the leadership team, which is really interesting because 
as we all know, um, religious institutions are going through change and how do you lead going forward? So let me ask Margaret to jump on in and there she is in her home in Oatland, still very close to Parramatta. That's right, yes. Hello, Margaret. Five minutes away. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, five minutes. So it's really lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, can you see everything, hear everything okay? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I can, yeah. So um, as I said, I uh, we met, caught up at a, I went to a Women in the Catholic Church meeting um, a long time ago, maybe 30 yes. years ago when I started yes. my spiritual journey. Yes, it was that long ago. Goodness me, I can't oh, believe it. Where are the years going? <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but it's interesting, as we came out of the the other interview, the conversation with Pia, I'm sure that there are things that were unique and different, but I suspect there are many similarities or things you can resonate with too, yeah? Definitely, yes. Just perhaps perhaps we uh, express them a little differently, but in their essence, there's a great, I found a number of things that would be similar to what I, how I see it and how I see or what I call the divine now. And, um, yeah, so... It was very interesting. And, of course, I think over in our tradition, the Christian tradition, over the years we have almost taken on a number of other practices from other religions like Buddhism and Hinduism mm -hmm. and practices and prayer and methods of meditation. So it's been quite a lovely way to, um, you know, see, see wider than just your own little tradition, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It, it really, I think the important thing is to find things that, as you say, methodologies or practices that actually work to make you feel closer to your own true essence mm. and closer to the divine. And if that happens to come from whatever tradition, it it's not it, it it feels like I think for some people it's like betrayal. I'm yeah. betraying the path, but actually, if it takes me closer to what my path is for, mm. it's a good thing. Right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. But, mm. So let's go into. I've got three questions for you in the same way I have for the others, and this um, is just reversal. I used to have the questions for you. <laughs> that's you. right. But I used to have to put my hand up. You don't have oh, to. You're <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to ask you how old you were when you entered the convent and where where was that? What was it that made you choose this life? Well, it's hard to believe it, but I was 17. Wow. I had left school the previous year. I had six months before I entered mm. and then I entered. And um, at age 17, as, as many of us in our talking and laughing about our history, our past, we, say, we really wonder whether our vows were valid. <laughs> Did we really <laughs> understand what we were doing? And probably At 17? Or, well, I, I had sort of two and a half to three years before I took my vows because that was all the time you had to prepare and, and find out and learn, and is this for me or is it not? But you know, I was twenty-one when I took my vows, and it's not. It's not. <laughs> and in that time, there hadn't been a lot of experience of life, you know. So, no. yeah. So that was. Um, so that's what happened. That's when it happened, you know. But um, it's a funny thing because I had always felt I wanted to do this, mm. and. Um, when you put this question about, you know, what made you do it and so on. And I think I have always had, from the time I was a little child, a little girl, I was interested in God. You know, I know it was probably partly from my family, um, lovely, loving family, but I, I knew 
it just interested me. It intrigued me, even as a little girl. And, you, you know, in those days in our church, the Catholic church, with its male domination, um, my brothers could be serving on the altar, but I couldn't because I was a girl. I never understood it. I didn't think it was fair. So I used to play being an altar server at home or a priest. So we'd practice up and down the hall, you know, I'd be giving communion to dolls and things. <laughs> so there was something in me always that was interested in the in the beyond, beyond something. But at of course at that time it was um it was not a free kind of um institution. And in fact it seemed to me that if I look at my life now, it seems to have been in two parts. And that mm. and my religious life in two parts prior mm. to the 1960s and after the 1960s. And uh, huge changes began happening for me in my understanding, in my living of my faith tradition, and in some of the things that you mentioned that uh, that I couldn't take, I couldn't accept, and had to sort of um, decide what do I believe. And that mm. still happens today. Many things mm. that we held so so strongly in that was before that what we call the Vatican Council that you knew about. It was that big change for the Catholic Church mm. when dear old Pope John the Twenty Third, the big roly poly Pope, who said it's time to open the windows and let some fresh air blow through this church of ours that had mm. become, you know, stuck in so many ways and possibly still is. And that opened up a whole new um, way of living, my life, my faith. And uh, mm -hmm. it's continued and still goes on. So, Margaret, that, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a big conversation in itself. Mm. But I want to ask you that, like, if you go back, were you, was that an exciting time? Was it a scary time? Or was oh, it a bit of both? Or The, ch the changes or the yeah. religious life? No, I loved them. The changes? That, that, yes. It couldn't be, they couldn't come fast enough for me. <laughs> but it wasn't easy because living the kind of religious life I had chosen to live it was very structured and it was very, um, I suppose, surrounded by all sorts of traditions and practices that had gone on for centuries. And you don't mm. change that overnight, you know, mm. just by saying it will happen. And for living in a community, as I do, um, People are so different in their understandings of things, in their personalities. And for some people, they found things very difficult to change, to let go of. We had to mm. go through a tremendous amount of um, discussion, study, transformation, prayer, to try to sort out, well, who are we and what, how, do we, how do we respond today mm. to the call that we believe we have? to be of service, to be in relationship with God and for my life within our world today. And so that's still there in many ways. It's never, never yeah. stops, you know. Yeah. Um, but thank God, I think, even though we are now coming, I think, to the end of our congregation, um, we have about 50 members now just in Parramatta mm. and uh, and we are an ageing group, as most women religious and other religious groups in the church are, except in, in the Western world anyway. Um, and we, ha we are dealing with that and we have been dealing with it. It's part of our, it's the mystery of life. You know? You're called in to offer yourself and fully as you can and then at the time that it's right, you let go. And to me, I think that's where we're at now. And... Um, but it's a big job <laughs> and, uh, yes, dealing with setting the structures that will be needed when we no longer have a leadership team, which we will have to let go of, but we will still have our sisters needing care and those who are younger who still want to be in ministry and they must be supported for as long as they can do it and want to do it. So, so that's where it's at at the moment for me in my 
in my life. It's just with mercy of Parramatta. Mm. That's a really significant thing, isn't it? It's a oh, real yeah. because it it's a it's a death, you yeah. know, yeah. something that was is precious That's right. and, mm. and an identity. Yeah. Mm. People have dedicated their life to, and then it's like, well, it's not, it's not got life and vitality in the same way. Yeah. So what do we do? Yes, it doesn't have numbers and strength and all of that. There is still life. It's an amazing thing, really. How in the last chapter there, which we have every, we've been having every six years, where you look at it all your life and you make the change in history. Yeah. The the number of even the sisters who are infirm are still involved as they see it in their mission in our ministry, whether it's by prayer or by simple things of kindness and so on. Those who are a bit more involved externally still want to do it and they're still doing it. So it's it's a beautiful um I think uh acknowledgement that while our physically our bodies may not be strong and mm. powerful like we used to be a powerful institution in the church and recognised as such, there's a humility that's needed now. And that allows God to move, I think, in a very significant way. And it's a trust in all will be well. All will be, as Julian of Norwich said, I think, yes. all will be well. <laughs> Don't have all to be All will be well. Mm. Yeah. And it's not up to me, you know. It's in God, really. Mm. So that is a great relief, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, 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 I wouldn't say it's easy. You know, life is precious and I want to go on forever, but I know I can't. <laughs> and um, Can I ask you how old you are now, Margaret? 82. 82. Hmm. Really, you know, sprightly and... Well, go I think that's why I got elected. My brain's still working, my body's holding up, so... They just did it. <laughs> I said, well, I am open and I am happy to offer anything I can if you feel that that's what is um, possible. And uh, they did, voted for it. So I said, all right, thy will be done, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And And are you seeing any new... Novitiates, are there any new ones coming? Not, not, not really. Not in the Western world. No, I think there are a number in in the two, in the two thirds world, as I prefer to call it. But I think I think everything has a time. You know, our com our community was brought into being when there was such a need for that when we began in Ireland, the poverty, the dispossession, mm -hmm. the um, Danger to women, particularly. That's why our group started, Catherine McCorney. And, you know, it's been the history right throughout the whole of Christendom from the earliest monastics. They lived and worked and then they died out and others arose and came and died out. It's been the whole process. And this is the same thing happening in the, I think this kind of religious life is, has had its time. It's done a magnificent job, particularly for, as we know, the Catholics in Australia who had very little to begin with, including education, and we were mm. brought out to provide it. Mm. And um, that was what my main ministry was, and I loved it, every minute of it. Um, but then after all the changes and so on, and uh, we saw we needed to move into other ministries rather than the institution of education because there are other people who could take on those leaderships of schools and teaching and so on, and we needed to go to other areas of need. So that's what we did. So, you know, it was been like a cycle, and it will always be a cycle, I think, of God's action in various people who were doing marvellous things outside religious life, doing one like yourself, you know, Mm. carrying on the spiritual life in your way and it's good and yeah yeah so it doesn't depend on us anymore but we'll yeah. do it to the very end actually mm. oh. Oh. <laughs> so 
Um, you you just answered beautifully my second question. So I'm jumping into my third, and then we circle back. <laughs> yeah. So over the decades of service, what key aspect of your faith has been constant source of strength? And how has it guided you through moments of doubt, challenge, or change? And so then this, I guess, comes into many of the things you just talked about in your relationship with God and the letting go. But perhaps you can go even further. There must have been moments of significant, well, crisis of faith or doubts. Yeah. Were there? Um, I'm not sure that I, I ever doubted um, in my faith the the reality of the divine, as I call it, or mystery. Yeah. I've, I've mm. never really, what, what I did doubt was the way it was being expressed or lived in many ways, but I don't think it ever took it away from me. But there were challenges and there were things that I've, I found very hard and difficult in relationships within the community, mm. um, things that you uh, found you were doing and it wasn't successful. Failure is always a wonderful way to remember mm. that you need something more than just your own ego. <laughs> and I think <laughs> fortunately um, there was always someone there within the community to, who could lift you up you know, I had wonderful and still have beautiful friends and friendships, mm. and um, and that has kept me going at times too. And uh, you kind of we you were, we were in it, we were in it together, you know. And um, mm. Mm. I think that was a very the, the community aspect. I think was important to me. Mm. Although sometimes I could have killed some of them. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's great, and it can drive you bonkers. <laughs> yeah, bunches of women together, Lord. <laughs> so but that's what community is meant to be. It's just not what I want, you know. Mm. It's trying to respond in love and kindness um, while still having, you know, the, the right and the necessity to speak up. You know when it, you felt it was necessary. So, mm. but, so I have I've learned much, and I've just realised, you know, that how little I I know and how ordinary I am, you know. But it's been good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to ask you to open up a little bit, if you don't mind, um, because you know you just said to be able to speak up and say what is true for you. And mm -hmm. I know that in these decades you've, um, and since 1960, and, mm -hmm. you know, as you said, back in the early days of being in the hall pretending to give communion, mm -hmm. well, you've also challenged some of those in your living, in your mm -hmm. doing and living, you've challenged some of those boundaries, haven't you? Yeah. That's right. And yeah. So talk a little about that and the and the courage I would imagine to mm. to stand and yeah. shatter the wall. Yes. Well, um, you know, I think. Pardon me. I, I think something that we have had to come to terms and to learn, and I'm still trying to come to terms with this. That ultimately, it, it is about our humanity. I mean, we've been created human and that wonderful writer, you know, mystic um, Pierre Thayer de Jardin, whom I think has just made some huge moves into understanding our universe and our place in it. He said once I was reading and it struck me very much, he said, you are not a human being in search of a spiritual life. You are a spiritual being immersed in the human experience. Mm. Mm. And it seems to me if anything Jesus was on about, it was about being human with its wonders and its faults and failings and all of it is all right. All of it God is within, like Bea was saying. That's my new grappling now with the notion of the, of the divine in everything. And um, it seems to me that... Um, Things I saw happening sometimes when I was teaching uh, with 
youth families, um, mm. practices that the church put on people that were inhuman, mm. and I did not accept them and I couldn't accept them. And, you know, trying to um, offer to people another way of understanding this unconditional love of God, no matter what happened in their lives, was very important and I loved doing it. Mm. I did, you know, speak at public things sometimes, even within our own community I spoke up and said, I think it's not right. And um, things, terrible, silly, silly practices that we had, you know, like sisters not being able to go to their parents' in requiems or their sisters' weddings just cutting you off from being human, that had to change. And um, and I, they were the things that I found so hard to do. And yet the other I just loved so much of the life in terms of the spiritual, you know, the music and the chapel and the, all of those things were just, they, they kept me going, I think, and my friends and spiritual directors that I've had. So that's where... Um, when I did my big breakthrough into trying to see a different way of knowing God, that's just mm. been continuing and becomes yeah. more marvelous. The more you, the less the less I know, the more I find wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And I think that's probably why you're still bright and alive and dynamic and got a good brain, because you keep exploring and discovering. Right. Yes, it's right. not like there's no end yeah. point like we know. Right. Yes, yeah. that that was the actual reason I called my work I did when I came back from overseas, um, Life Quest. I saw it as a journey into freedom and compassion. Those mm. two things are so important in I think in any person's life to be free, mm. to be your true self without illusion, without you know, to be re real in that sense, but compassion always for yourself and for others. Yeah. And I'd say there's a similarity with Pia's understanding of it there as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same God, isn't it, or the divine, whatever. And it's in our one. tradition, as we follow what Jesus told us, that's ultimately why he came to tell us about this amazing God. It was yeah. not about a cruel ogre waiting to punish, which is unfortunately still the way it's often seen. Yeah. But an unconditional loving reality and in the centre of everything that exists, not separate from. Yeah. So that's where I find my my faith today, trying to grapple with that and um, and enjoy it, be free in it. Mm. Right. Mm. Margaret, so, that, that so kind of brought us to our time. I'm going to come back to you after our next but I've got for these these questions that I ask yeah. the others. So, yeah. do you have a favourite daily ritual? Well, it, it certainly is. It's it's my my reflection of a morning always uh, in silence, in quiet. And I I don't know if I mentioned it to you or to someone else that there are fewer and fewer words. I might use a little passage from some book that I'm reading, or sometimes scripture, not always. Um, to sort of stimulate a further thing. But basically I think I'm just trying to be quiet, still, and just be open to whatever happens in prayer, you know, or reflection. That's that's what I do. Yeah. Thank you. That's pretty well every day. And then of course in the community we have all sorts of things that, you know, rituals yes. and practices and so on, which are lovely because we do mm. them ourselves. We're not dependent on Father. <laughs> As I know what <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, so it, could you recommend a book that has significantly influenced your spiritual journey? Oh, there's so many. But there, when you asked me that, one, one jumped into my mind straight away, and it was a much earlier time, in, and it was called Jesus Before Christianity. Oh. It's by, by Albert Nolan, and it, it actually blew open a whole new understanding of what he was on about and what we should be on about. And um, it, it's, a, it's for me, it's a world changer. It's a, it changed my 
it began changing. And I think that was in the 70s I first read that. And uh, it's been reprinted and reprinted. He's a South African Dominican, and he okay. he experienced the dreadful apartheid and things like that. But he actually showed us that he wanted to write this book to talk about Jesus before Christians got hold of him. <laughs> Turning into something you probably wasn't. <laughs> That's wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to ask you, can you share a moment during your journey that has unexpectedly brought you immense joy? Well, there are a lot of those as well in relationships and so on. But I think probably um, the experience overseas in study, there were moments there that broke through. They were aha moments. And I thought, oh, I didn't know this. This is amazing, that kind of thing. Learning, um, really. Learning, learning, learning and being open to it. And then the first time I did the cosmic walk when, that, that actually gives you the actual bodily, um, tr try to understand the bodily, um, in a bodily way, that is walking it, The um, from the Big Bang to now, that 14 billion years of God's action that I am part of and everything that exists is that moment of doing that, that I'd had no idea of this, that must have been the big breakthrough for me in my life and still is. It sounds quite similar to Pia, mm -hmm. quite a similar yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, and finally, if you could share one piece of advice with other individuals who may be aspiring to a, a life of service and spirituality, and uh, what would it be? Um, I think I think it's important to know what your passion is for your own self development and beyond. Something that pulls you out of yourself to others, and then I think you need a very good guide to advise mm -hmm. because um yeah it's it's it, we can be <laughs> as i said we can have some illusions sometimes that are not real there's real we have to be real i think about ourselves as far as we can be and then be open to something beyond that and that's what i would suggest to a young person or anyone to continue to explore to try mm. to be free within it, but what are you passionate for in terms of a spiritual life? So that's how I think I'd Great. say. Mm. Great. Margaret, thank you. Um, we're about to Go swing to over to Costa Rica and we're coming back to Oatlands after right. that. Really, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. loving being Love with you. Thank you so much. There. Yeah, really. Adult to adult, very good. Mm. Yeah. So mm. see you after Marianne. Right. So I stop Everything. my video? Yeah, that'd be great. Video and, and audio. Thank you. Okay. So as I say, we're going to head over to Costa Rica. Um, and Marianne is uh, Brahma Kumari's dedicated sister and her journey is very interesting as well. And I don't really need to introduce so much because in the video, in the pre-record, um, you're going to find out about her. And so all I can say is enjoy as much as I'm sure you've already enjoyed listening and being with Margaret and Pia, Marianne Lizana, who's the coordinator in Costa Rica. So welcome, Marianne. It's lovely to have you here with us on Universe. And even though this is pre-recording, it's very nice to know that at two o'clock in the morning, your time, you'll be sleeping, but we'll be with you. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome. Marianne is from Costa Rica, and she's the coordinator of the Brahma Kumaris organization over there. And... Tonight, as we know, we're talking about nuns. And there was a very interesting book called If Nuns Ruled the World. 
and it was written by a journalist called Joe Piazza. And she talked about 10 passionate women who are leading lives that, I think she was mainly talking about Catholic nuns, but in this conversation that we're doing today, and we've spoken with um, Pia Gimassi, who is an Italian-American living in Taiwan, and she's she does she doesn't use the word nun. She's been more of a monastic, and now she leads her dharma life outside of the the institution. But we're talking with Margaret Hinchy, who's also a Catholic nun, and was my school principal when I was in primary school. And then Marianne. And in Brahma Kumaris, you don't say nun, right? We don't say we're nuns but let's have a look at this exploration today and i've got some questions for you so the first one welcome marianne thank you thank you Carol. <laughs> it's beautiful i one of my best friends is a catholic nun and and we we had a, this kind of chats uh conversations sometimes and it's it's beautiful topic so thank you mm -hmm. Great, good. So I'm going to ask you three questions. And the first one is that the Brahma Kumaris emphasize the soul's true nature beyond physical identity. And how has this philosophy shaped your understanding of self? And how might it resonate with women who are seeking a sense of purpose and identity today? And you've worked with a lot of women, so yeah yeah and even from i i don't know why from even childhood or when i was teenager uh, i was always feeling not very happy with these stereotypes and uh, with my brother we always were competing with one another and who is stronger who can do more uh, because in that age, you learn a lot of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And my feeling was that I had to, to, to fight against them. Mm -hmm. And so I was not really happy with the life. And, and, and looking at the reality mm -hmm. of the world, um, I felt that was not fair. There was a lot of injustice against women because of these stereotypes that what you cannot do and what you can do or you must do no mm -hmm. so when i came to realize about the self beyond that those stereotypes just the essence of the self mm -hmm. and even beyond all the gender conditioning it gave me a lot of freedom just to be myself mm -hmm. and even the freedom to 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 understand better who i am without fighting against anyone mm -hmm. because that was tiring too and i used to work with with women that were um abused so i used to to even have dreams about protecting them and sometimes i had these feelings against the the kind of the persons that are aggressive yeah the perpetrators the yeah. perpetrators yeah. but then I, it's, it's it's not going to end unless we are going beyond those stereotypes beyond those limitations we must all of us go back to the self mm -hmm. where we can be uh very pure not rejecting, not criticizing, just understanding better the qualities, the strength, the capacities of each one beyond any anything else. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go into another question now. And if we've got time, I might come back to something about the first one. But you're not what might be called a typical nun right yet your life is one of spiritual service and dedicated to god or supreme or source 
how old were you when you began this life and and why what was it that called you to this kind of way of living <laughs> Well, I think that each one of us has uh, its own call, no? But um, I was, I, I grew up with non-religion. Uh, my parents um, uh, said to me that they will not believe in God anymore. <laughs> but if I, I, I had a choice, if I want to go to some kind of church, they will allow me, but they will not teach me that. So. I grew up with this this feeling that God it's is there. I don't know how, but I just knew. And um, then I learned about God from different friends. And I used to work uh, when I was in high school. Um, so I, I took some times when it was holidays to work, and I met a missionary. Missionary, the ones who go to missions. And I love to listen their stories and how uh, they surrender their life to God, to serve, to to help other people to connect with God, you know. And I was interested in, in those things. Um, so and and so I I was always kind of looking for a connection and understanding about the spirituality, but mostly the connection with God and once um my friends started to to do the communion you know the in the catholic church and my parents they didn't put me into any kind of uh none of the sacraments you didn't go exactly. through. yeah i didn't know how how was all of that uh but they told me my friends i i once uh, went with them to the church that uh, what they ate what they put in their mouth is is kind of is is something that you feel that God is, is inside of you. So I was so excited to experience that. So once I went by myself, uh, and I decided that I will do it. So I I went there. I had that experience, and I when they give me um, that, I really felt that. I want this connection with God. So I had the experience of connection with God. Mm. But I was innocent. I didn't know anything about procedures, the proper procedures. So when I went back to my home and I explained to my mom what, what I did, she was very strict with me because she said that it's not respectful because you have to go through all these <laughs> procedures and you, you cannot do like that. So I felt bad. That why with God you need so much bureau bureaucracy? Mm -hmm. I always wanted a connection, direct connection. And then um, I feel that um, there are times in in the humanity, in, in the human life, and in, in the cycle of life of humanity, that the connection with God is very, very important. And for me, when I was a teenager, I came to this path when I was 19. Give me a lot of um, a lot of hope, mm. understanding about reality, and the connection with God that I was looking for. I used to have a lot of experiences. And I'm still now feeling more natural, that connection. Mm. But... Um, I decided to dedicate because I knew that this life for me is for service. And the service I want to do requires all my attention. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I want to cultivate that. Um, even though uh, I worked, I work uh, and I, am, I'm, I still feel that that is for God. It's not that I'm working separate of my spiritual life. It's all part of the same. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And when you say it's for God, what do you mean by that? By that, I mean that um, all the desires, for example, I, I used to have a boyfriend before. And then uh, 
when it comes to the time to the moment to decide if you want to follow more with him and to get married then i was i realized is it it was not the life i want mm -hmm. uh it's like you sometimes you surrender your life to children you surrender your life to husband you surrender your life to a cause i wanted to surrender my love life to god and to do what what had to be done in these times so it's what i i realized in that moment that that was what i wanted wow beautiful thank you and our final question is the Brahma Kumaris promote a strong sense of like spiritual sisterhood. It's an organization led by women. And maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Um, your service and professional work have often found you supporting girls and women and often in very difficult situations, right? Can you share how the presence of this sisterhood, the sacred feminine principle has empowered you and others in difficult times or situations? It's a kind yeah. of question, but yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, um, in this world, normally women's, uh, women fight against each other mm -hmm. in order to have the attention, for example, uh, of uh, the boss or, you know, because in we have to look good for, for all the, the other and especially if it's a man and we compete but what i feel is that um when we are beyond that i i realize that i can feel more the sisterhood when i'm more in that awareness of the soul of of being the soul being beyond that and understanding and have um put put myself in the shoes of the women that is uh surviving situations that i cannot imagine because i work with people that have been sexually exploited or abused or you know ass assaulted and there is a lot of pain there and so what i feel is um uh, to understand the strength that that soul have to deal with all of that allow me to be closer and now to be closer to others even other women and in this institution it it you know this this thing to be of being together as sisters have helped me to be um to understand better how to make changes with non-violence uh from inside out with this empathy and i will give you an, an example i was uh working a lot doing a lot of things in brahma kumaris and in the job and i suddenly got a lot of uh, uh, sick i was very sick and one of those sisters from other countries she she wanted to empower me she wanted to help so she she was aware what i was dealing and she was very um uh, uh busy too but she took the time to, and told me you know when you come to this country you come to my to my place i i will do something for you she invited me and i didn't realize that she was inviting me to rest mm. and, and she supported me a lot she celebrated my birthday she 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 was very aware that what i was needing in that moment was just that mm. and we had a wonderful time and when i came back to the country i had another kind of uh, energy and so i could trust her even even though i was not telling her how was feeling you know physically i didn't even realize that i was not feeling okay she was aware and and then this kind of help that we give to each other to put each other in front um is what i have felt a network of support is what i feel right now the sisterhood is where you know that you always 
can have someone by your side when you need. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And it's also very different from what you explained in the beginning about this kind of uh, world of scarcity where women feel there's little opportunity in a in the old systems and so they tend to fight and compete for few opportunities but when there's this sense of everyone in their own uh speciality or or you, you i mean i love to see that you're doing what you're doing and doing it so brilliantly it doesn't make me threatened or jealous or or like I don't get a chance. No, it, it reminds me I have the same chance. I need, you know, I've got specialities and I should use those as well. So it's a very different thing, isn't it? It's an unlimited space of possibility and support. That's that's true. And and it's interesting that when we are looking at the specialities in that sense, um um we naturally use the power of love that it's supposed that we have like the women have always the power of love but now with this feeling of of sisterhood i feel that there is a, a real power in loving each other instead of competing or you know it's creating environments when 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 there are environments where you feel that that appreciation or understanding or you mm. can grow but in, in environments where there is competition or jealousy you you just feel that you cannot express yourself yeah. so that's that's what i have uh, experienced in moments of of crisis okay. thank you okay so that's the end of our three questions for you and these are questions that four questions um that I've asked the others as well. Um, so do you have a favorite daily ritual? What is the one daily ritual or practice that brings you the most peace and connection? It's uh, waking up in very early in the morning, 3.30, and just being in silence and in connection with God. Okay. Could you recommend a book that has significantly influenced your spiritual journey? You know, uh, once I did a, a personal retreat with this book of um, Eastern Mind for Western, you know, from Anthony Estrano? Uh, Eastern Mind for Western. Or, oh, mm, I don't know, Eastern something for Western Minds? <laughs> yes, like that. Well, yeah. yes, yeah. it's, it's Anthony Estrano, and it's a book about the why well, is silence important mm -hmm. why meditation so how we can go deep in that that experience and that have helped me a lot in in this in this path great and i think it's available through eternity inc which also sponsors universe so let's see um now can you share a moment during your journey that unexpectedly brought you immense joy <laughs> well you know um it's brief but um once i went i wanted to go to india and i didn't have money so i went to us for work in a work and travel thing uh program and i worked so hard but i didn't know that that amount of money allowed me to go to india and when I went with another friend and the friend, when she counted the money, it wasn't enough. She, she was not having the same aim to go to India, but I was having, I needed a certain amount. And when I count my, the money I did, it was just enough to go to India. And I was so happy that I was able to do it. I put all my effort and I was suddenly so happy. So I'm sure whenever we have a pure desire and do, we do a little bit extra, it's going to be fulfilled. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Now, do you have one piece of advice that you could share 
with individuals aspiring to a life of spiritual service and dedication? What would it be if you had one piece of advice? I I would say that it has to be lived um, in a natural way and that each one of us has our own personal and intimate connection with God and that we we don't have to prove or to compete or just it has to be very natural if not if we are imposing things to ourselves it's not going to work we have to enjoy the spiritual life uh that was something that i learned and doing things from from that space not from the space of duty but the space of of love beautiful now would you like to take us into a we're closed now and um take us in through an experience of this connection or however you, wherever you want to take us really that would be like <laughs> a few minutes and thank you caroline what you're doing is is so beautiful it's inspiring so thank you very much thank you for <laughs> being available marianne yeah beautiful so i will suggest first to relax to um be um allow your body to feel comfortable and imagine an inner sacred space where you are secure, safe, where you don't have anything to do. Nothing to resolve. You can just connect with yourself. Imagine that you connect with a part of yourself that is very innocent. That is full of purity, joy. That part of you that has no fear. that sacred part of you that is divine. Just feel that you originally are that innocent soul or being. Embrace by an eternal love from the source. You will always be embraced by this love that comes from that pure source of love. the Father, the Son of Wisdom, and I have the right to feel this love. I accept this love is for me. Dissolving any kind of pain in my heart. Enjoying feeling a deep connection with this sweet 
source of love. Om Shanti. Marianne, thank you. That was just gorgeous. I really was able to very easily find my way there. So I hope all, all the others who are listening and with us today could touch that space too. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate your being with us, making the time and uh, that we could work it out so you could. Thank you very much, Caroline. And lots of love for all of you who are looking this <laughs> at this time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Right. So we are coming to the end. And I have to say that I can imagine if the world was. <laughs> ruled wouldn't be ruled would be collaboratively kind of held by these amazing women it would certainly be a different place than what we're currently living in so i'm inspired really inspired so i, I just want to bring margaret in for the last couple of minutes as we say goodbye mm -hmm. um margaret do you have anything that you'd like to reflect as we wrap up from what Marianne said or Pierre or where we sit now? Um, I, I love the way Marianne brought a um, word I don't think I used, I, I may have, but, and that was love. And it seems to me that while our, our understanding of love can be so, you know, superficial, that I think the love she's talking about and the love we're talking about and the and the essence of our lives and the, the mystery of the divine, it is love. Yeah. And I thought that was that was beautiful to have that a reminder that we what we do and who we are is because of love. Mm. Yes. That's my last thought. Mm. Thank you. You did mention it. Did you I? mentioned about the unconditional love because of, in the contrast of the, the terrible yeah. kind of terrible yeah. thing that had been set up in history. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Margaret, we're going to close now. Thank you so much. Would you like to close us out with a very brief offering of some, some prayer that's close yeah. to your heart? Or you can make did, it up. I, well, I did bring one because I, I find now in my trying to understand now this evolutionary god history is one that i'm using quite a bit and i think it's because uh, basically i think now we don't know who or what that source is that mystery we're in an we're in unknowing but we have to use word we have to use imagery we have to use something to help us to and so i find this book i've use a lot actually called prayers to an evolutionary god and one of them in particular i love using because it uses metaphors or names that for god for the divine that i like and it just expands my mind you know because i think if we keep using the same word god my father that's what you ultimately end up thinking about <laughs> and it's not <laughs> whatever this divine is it's not a man in the sky <laughs> no no, it's not. No, no. So it, it, I, I, if it's all right, I, I'd love to finish my offering to you this way and um, trying to live this myself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margaret. Yes, yeah. please. Boundless sea of love and energy, our future and our God. May all your dreams for us come true, your steady mother-like imaginings and your fatherly hopes. Your creative purpose is evident everywhere in the world. Guide us to our truest selves. 
co-creators with you of this environment. Persuade us to be worthy inheritors of the astonishing evolving reality in which we live. Appreciators of the daytime in all its colors and aromas, admirers of the heavens at night, reverent caretakers of our generous green earth, respectful of everything alive, especially of our fellow humans in all their bewildering diversity and beauty. May it be so. Mm. Thank you. Margaret, I love that. Thank you. What is the name of the book? Prayers to an Evolutionary prayers God? Prayers to an Evolutionary God, yes. The pure prayers of intimacy, prayers of questioning, prayers of ambiguity, but using broad, broad understanding. So not limiting more God. The, more the mystical, the mystical journey, the, the mystical mystic journey. journey. The, that's right. The connection of everything. Yes. To everything. Margaret, so, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so Caroline. much. Thank you, it's Caroline been, and Pia, which is still there. <laughs> and uh, so this was a lovely opportunity to share. And as I always find, sharing with adult, other adults who are in this journey, there's always something beautiful that comes from it and gives and inspires you to keep going, you know, to keep right. on this journey. So thank you. Thank mm. you. I'm very, very re-inspired, very mm. much so. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm. Okay. And thank you to everyone who's um, with us here tonight and who's watching in the replays. And I look forward to seeing you again sometime. Thank you for joining us tonight. Gabriel will be back next month and with another session of Universe. Have a lovely month ahead. And that's it. And of course, the book that Marianne was talking about is available at um, Eternity Inc. and it's called Eastern Wisdom for Western Mind.